Good morning, everybody. Hope that your Wednesday's off to a great start. Mine's starting off pretty good. I can't complain about anything. And as I say, even if I did, nobody would listen or care. Um, hope you got a good cup of coffee with you. Um, we're going to get into a just a powerhouse as a powerhouse of a passage this morning. Pardon me. I'm going to adjust this camera just a wee bit. Yeah, that's a bit better. Um, between now and Easter, each of these Wednesdays, I'm just looking at the lectionary epistle reading for the upcoming Sunday, and the all of these texts are just so powerful. And this morning is probably the biggest one of the lot. Um, it's Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Um, Ephesians has been called the queen of the epistles. Now, it's not as long as Romans, not by long shot, um, but it is. it has been called the queen of the epistles. And this, this 10 verses is, I mean, you can't say it's the most powerful in the whole Bible, but it's got to be in the team picture. Um, if I were to make a list of my favorite passages and the passages that I consider most important, this would be in that list. It'd be near the top. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. In these 10 verses, <clears throat> we find ourselves going from totally lost to salvation and sanctification and ultimately glorification. Everything, the whole sweep of it in 10 verses. I'm going to read this and then I'll just, I'm going to read it for us and then just sort of unpack it a little bit and we'll see what's going on in here that makes this passage so incredibly powerful. And it's not just powerful, it's important. This is important stuff because it this is this is the core of what we believe. <clears throat> and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. The Spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead on our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. <clears throat> I, this is a passage that I highly recommend you just spend some time with. Spend some time with it. Um, it's worth memorizing. This is, this is the gospel. This is... Um, I said a year ago, about a year ago, I was preaching on John chapter 3, Jesus Nicodemus, and in the sermon I said that that might be the most important sermon I've ever preached, not the best, but the most important simply because of the subject matter. And when we look at this, it's the same way. It is that important. This is... Um, this is like the third rail in an electric subway system. This is the middle rail that powers it. So let's unpack this just a little bit. What makes it so powerful? So we're just going to walk straight through it. When Paul begins this chapter, what is our natural state? He says we're dead. 
and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, what do we know about dead people? We know that dead people stay dead. Dead people don't move. Dead people don't do anything. Dead people are dead. And they tend to stay dead, right? Um, there's no activity. There's no movement. They're not, they're not living human beings anymore. When we are lost, when we are in our natural state, when we are lost, we're not even fully human. We can't be fully human as God intended until we, until Christ has saved us. Um, we all, by nature, are lost. That's the, the inconvenient truth here, um, the uncomfortable truth, that we all, by nature, are lost. By, na by nature, none of us are in, so to speak. By nature, we are lost, following the prince, following the way of the world. We know the way the world works. You don't have to look at the world around us too much to see that the world is broken, that there are all grades of hatreds and wars and immorality all over the place. Even right now, um, there's, you know, China's in the news for, um, for genocide against one of its minority populations. This is, this is the state of the world. And by nature, we walk according to the prince of the power of the world. We follow the way of the world. And what does Paul say? Among whom we all once lived. This is us. Left to ourselves, this is us. We follow the way of the world. And if you go to the, look at any, like, elementary school playground, <clears throat> the kid that's a little off, that's a little different, that dresses a little differently, that looks a little differently, that speaks a little differently, that kid gets beaten up and bullied, which, which wildebeest on the African plain get, becomes lion food, the weaker one. That's the way of the world. And that's the way we are. That is, by nature, the way we are. We are broken, sinful people by nature. It is who we are. We're dead. We are dead. We are on our own, unable to turn toward God, unable to repent, unable to do anything. We are dead. And I think we need to really let that sink in if we're going to get what comes next. We are totally dead. Lost. And then comes one... This incredibly, this incredible two words, but God, but God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we're dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, even though we are totally dead, but God. Even though we are lost, following the prince of the power of the air, but God begot, but God loved us. Before we were even alive, before we have any capacity to do anything, God loves us. Dead people stay dead, right? But God makes us alive together with Christ. But God. <clears throat> but God. And Paul refers to God raising um, Jesus from the dead. Normally in Paul's letters, he refers to God having raised Christ from the dead. It's curious that in the Gospels, Jesus refers to himself being the active agent and Jesus sort of being the, 
himself the active agent in resurrection, Paul seems to place the active power in resurrection with God, not that it really matters that much, but it's just curiosity. And so the power that raised Christ from the dead two days after crucifixion is the power that makes us alive. It is the same power that makes us alive even though we are dead. And we are raised with Christ. And Paul seems to just fast forward from here all the way to the end. We're raised with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. And that's a glimpse not just of, sal of salvation, but a glimpse of what our ultimate state will be in the future kingdom after the resurrection. That is, that is our ultimate future. And so we go from being totally lost, dead, to alive with Christ, with him, in the heavenly kingdom, after the resurrection. <clears throat> we are dead, but God makes us alive. We are dead, we are lost, but God loves us and makes us alive. <clears throat> and how does this work? Paul go, gives us a sweep from being dead spiritually to reigning with Christ at the end. And Paul seems to come back and, oh, oh, I forgot to mention how this all works. How does this take place? For, great, for by grace through faith you've been saved. And this not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. Grace through faith, grace through faith. We are saved by grace. And this is... We are saved by grace and this grace is appropriated, if you will, or accessed by faith. And we we really are passive in our own salvation. We our only role is to accept to by faith what has already been done what has been provided for us. We we can't save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. That is entirely work of God. Nothing that we do. We do nothing to deserve God's love. God loves us while we are totally lost. God loves us before we before we even before we even know God, who God is. If it depends on any at all, if our salvation depends at all on what we do, then it's not grace. It's just a matter of deserving stuff. We're just getting what we deserve. And something I I say often, quite often in sermons, is the Christian life is not about justice. It really is not. It's not about justice or deserving anything. The Christian life is always about grace and always about mercy. It's not a matter of justice. If we get what we deserve, we are in a heap of trouble. God is the worker in all of this. From beginning to end, God is the active worker, the active agent. I love how this ends. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship, meaning God is God working within us, recreating us in Christ. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus, referring to our salvation. This inner working that takes that takes place that God does for us 
And why does God do this? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for, for good works. So we are never, ever saved by the works that we do. Ever. But we are saved for good works. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. The purpose of our salvation is so that we would walk with Christ and be transformed and live into the works that God already sees for us. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're never ever saved by the things that we do, by the good works that we do. We are saved for the good works. The whole purpose for God transforming us and saving us and doing something in here is so that we would live to his glory and live into the good works that he foresaw for us. Reflect on this. Like I said, this is um, one of the most powerful passages, one of the most important passages in the whole Bible. I don't know that I'd call it the most important, but it's got to be up there really close to the top. So reflect on this. Um, if you're of a bent to memorize scripture, this would not be a bad one to memorize. So think about these things and have a great rest of your Wednesday.